When I wake up in my own pink world, I get up out of bed and wave to my homegirls. Hey, Bobby. Hey. She's so cool. All dolled up, just playing chess by the pool. Come on, we got important things to do. It's her and her and me and you and me. What? What happened? Well, there's this woman that I've been trying to interview. I found out she was just about to reveal that she was starting the first company to publicly announce plans to pursue editing human embryos. Her name is Kathy Tai, and what she was announcing was her latest startup, a fledgling company based in New York City that, and get this, she was calling the Manhattan Project. But she thinks the scale of what she wants to do is just <laughs> as bold as the original Manhattan Project that created the atomic bomb. Manhattan Project will explore how to do gene correction in human embryos more safely. Well, we called it the Manhattan Project because the science is very important, almost if not actually more important, than the science behind the first Manhattan Project. But also, I just love Manhattan. It's a great city, and I think it's bound to be an epicenter for genomic research. That's why we called it Manhattan Project. I talked about this stuff with Malcolm Collins and his wife, Simone. They're vocal pronatalists. People can say, well, you're playing God by using this type of technology. And I'd say people would say that with any technology of the past. They'd say you're playing God with glasses. They'd say you're playing God with blood transfusions. I'm really excited for a future within human history where there are some people that have decided to really lean into technologies like this. I do see his point there. I mean, everything we do nowadays is so enhanced by technology from the computers that we use, now AI helping us think and you know, produce content faster, whether it's essays or tweets or videos, I do believe that technology does enhance us in a lot of ways. And at some point in history, whether it be test tube babies at the time, like IVF, or even when vaccines were discovered and invented, I mean, at that time, that was also seen as a controversial technology that people pushed back on, saying that this technology is so unnatural. But from 2025, looking back on it, those are obvious advances that were needed. And so I do see his point about how technology is enhancing humans in so many ways, and this is one of the ways. However, the one caveat I will say is from a scientific perspective, it needs to be accurate and safe before we can get there. And that's what we're trying to work towards. And we do that with animal models, human cell lines, and only with IRB and ethics committee approval would we even think about moving into human embryonic stem cells or embryos. You know, Ty says her Manhattan Project plans to test newer, potentially less risky gene editing techniques than CRISPR. The, you know, that's the technique that Chinese scientists use. Okay, so I think this is a good place to pause and just like talk about what CRISPR is exactly. Sure, it's, you know, it's a relatively new technology that allows scientists to modify DNA much more easily than ever before. And many scientists think CRISPR will revolutionize scientists, that it maybe already is, because it's already led to new treatments for inherited diseases like sickle cell. But mm. CRISPR be, can be kind of messy, so okay. scientists are exploring. I just want to say that somatic gene therapies worked in sickle cell disease cost two to three million dollars per dose per patient. It is certainly not affordable for the vast majority of Americans, so that is why we're looking at germline gene therapies. It is only one or a handful of cells that you're actually delivering the gene therapy to. That makes it a lot simpler than a somatic gene therapy. And I believe that many people, especially those that have heritable genetic diseases that are devastating, and especially those that are already going through IVF and they may have you know, one or more embryos affected by this pathogenic mutation, they should have the option to choose if they want to eliminate that disease in their embryo. Diseases like cystic fibrosis, maybe Alzheimer's, by editing out disease-causing mutations at the embryonic level. Wow. There's so many diseases that have no cures and there's not going to be a cure for them for many more decades. And I think that we have a responsibility to talk about this with patients that do have those terrible diseases if they want the option to not pass that on to their future generations. But you know, Gina, some invest... Doesn't that sound so obvious? If you have a genetic mutation that is extremely harmful, it's a heritable cancer or a disease that has no cure, or the cure is just very expensive, wouldn't you not want to pass that on to your child if you didn't have to, and it's just one single nucleotide change? Where do you draw the line? Yeah, it's, and that, that's part of the problem. That's a very fuzzy line. Mm -hmm. 
but some people are saying that if this does turn out to be safe, they say parents should basically just have the option, have the freedom to use it in all sorts of ways. Right, like physical features. That is not us. We do not endorse enhancements. There are a lot of polygenic traits that are extremely complex to map out on the genome. For example, IQ is one that involves so many different genes and therefore from a gene editing perspective, it's something that is almost impossible to do and guarantee a safe and effective result. So at Manhattan Project, we're only focused on diseases. Many scientists do endorse researching genetic modification of sperm, eggs, and embryos. And the reason for that is they think it could lead to big discoveries about basic human biology and reproduction. And that could have lots of benefits, like leading to new ways to treat infertility, maybe mm -hmm. prevent miscarriages. Yeah. I talked about this with Dr. Paula Amato. She works on embryo editing at the Love her. Health and Science University. And she says it's tough because the federal government doesn't fund this kind of work. NIH doesn't typically support human embryo research, so if the technology bros are interested, that would be well Technology bros. Like, oh. Yeah. I'm dead. <laughs> Sorry. Technology bros is such a funny term to call it, but at the same time, I do see her point. From her perspective, and a lot of researchers across the country, especially at OHSU, where reproductive genomics is a very core focus, there is no federal funding for this research. Yet, technologies like mitochondria replacement therapy, also known as MRT, or in the media you might have seen three-parent child, and it can treat certain things like infertility or mitochondria DNA diseases that can cause embryo arrest, and that research is just not funded. And it's simply because it's in the germline category. So anything that has to do with germline gene corrections, whether it's in the sperm, egg, or embryo, it's all forbidden from a federal funding perspective. And that started in the early 2010s. Congress pulled funding from the FDA to review this technology. So that is still the case in 2025, despite this being a very vital factor in reproductive genomics and reproductive technologies in general. So that is part of Paula's work. I am a big fan of her work at OHSU. The chief executive officer for the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Human heritable germline editing is quite clearly a terrible solution in search of a problem. If you make a mistake, the mistake passes on to all future generations. So that's a pretty big pause. This is a paradox. The biggest criticisms in this field are about if it's done not properly and gets passed down to their next generation, you know, we're really screwed. This is not a good way to use this technology because it's not safe and the consequences are so large. Well, I think where we're at right now is that it's been a seven year paradox that we're facing. We've been saying that that was the biggest criticism for the 2018 experiment with Dr. He. If it is not mature enough to be used in a clinical setting, shouldn't we be doing research towards it in animal models, similar to how we do drug discovery, and also in human cell lines that are not derived from embryonic stem cells. They're just simple cell lines that people use in research all the time. To me, that is a responsible and slow way to move this field forward and we can do it transparently. And eventually this technology should be evaluated for clinical use once enough data is generated from these studies, very similar to clinical trials for drugs. But to simply say that this technology is not mature enough, therefore we should never touch it because the consequences could be so big. I think again, that's such a lazy way to look at it. And that's what everyone has been saying for the last seven years. And if we never change that, then, then we'll never progress in this space. So there is a path forward and a way to do this in a way that can satisfy scientific requirements and prove safety and efficiency without going straight to human embryos right now. Safety, the top priority, she says, and at least initially would only try to edit out diseases. She knows this kind of work has to be done very carefully and with strict oversight. In science, you need a lot of ethical oversight from something called IRBs. IRBs are committees that determine if the protocol, materials used, things like donated human germline cells are obtained correctly and within the realms of the law, as well as approving certain experiments to be conducted in frontier science. So that is something that we intend to do every step along the way. It's something that I definitely respect a lot about the researchers in this space that have done it the right way and would only move forward if they can't show that it is. Mm. 
But the Manhattan Project's high solely argues the potential benefits of editing human embryos could be huge. If you have the tools to actually correct the pathogenic mutation that can be passed down to other generations. Is it sort of like ethical to do it or not to do it? And I would argue it would be more ethical to stop that mutation. I'm very proud of her for saying that. That's my co-founder, Ariona, because at the end of the day, if ethics is about doing good for humanity, which it should be, is it more or less ethical to gene correct a pathogenic mutation at the embryo level if we have the technology to do so safely and efficiently? It's the idea of what all physicians are trained to think about, this idea of do no harm. And I think there's a difference between do no harm and do no net harm. I believe that it is unethical to withhold treatment if we have it. We should investigate this technology and develop it responsibly, and we should not withhold this treatment if it exists for people that need it. Yeah, so I agree with what Ariona said there. In the United States, U.S. regulations would prohibit trying to make gene-edited babies out of you know, genetically modified embryos. Mm -hmm. And several leading scientific organizations just recently called for at least a 10-year moratorium on anyone trying to make gene-edited babies, okay. including... Okay, that is crazy. 10-year moratorium. Scientists will do this in other countries where there are no rules and regulations and do this underground without sharing the protocols or the results or the data. And I, I don't think that's right. I think to push this field forward, you need to share the data transparently with everyone, all the stakeholders between the bioethicists, other scientists through the scientific community and publishing, as well as the general public and regulators who are making policies and updating policies in this space. So by calling a moratorium, it's a very lazy way to address this very complex issue. And at the end of the day, I don't think it makes sense because this technology can help a lot of people. Since we launched the Manhattan Project, I've gotten dozens and dozens of emails and messages from patients that have a particular mutation that is debilitating and heritable, whether it's a disease that they have or something they carry that they want to remove in their future embryos. And they even asked us if we had the technology available now. We had to say, no, it's not legal, uh, but we're working towards it. Seeing all the patient feedback you know, unsolicited, uh, of course, like these people came to us. I think it's so important to address this in the public, in the light, with transparency. And this, these aren't just feel good words. This is a must. This is a very powerful technology that can change medicine for the better and can help millions of patients in the world, possibly billions. And we shouldn't shy away from it. By calling a moratorium, I think, is a very lazy way to look at this. I talked with a bunch of bioethicists who agreed that renewed interest is making them very worried. And they argue that this movement is today's version of eugenics, you know, that long discredited <laughs> pursuit of supposedly genetically superior people. Yeah. And I talked about this with Katie Hassan. She's the associate director of the Center for Genetics and Society. Eugenics? No. Ultimately, there are so many diseases that have no cures for many more decades and they incur a huge national healthcare cost. So we're trying to provide a different option to eliminate these incurable diseases at the embryo level for those that choose it. This is not eugenics. This is an option that we wanna provide parents. I do not agree that it is eugenics. Eugenics was a horrifying thing that happened in science in the 20th century. It came with forced sterilization, policies that marginalize certain people and one of the worst moments of science. So while I understand the fear and anxiety around comparing new technologies to that horrifying experience that we've had, I don't believe that this is close to eugenics at all, quite the opposite. It is about preventing disease. And this is an option that's given to families that are affected by heritable disease. And it is meant to be safe and preventing disease rather than forcing anyone to do anything they don't want to do. It is not a decision that is simply made by a bioethicist or a select group of scientists or even one regulator or congressman. I believe that this is a technology that should have many stakeholders contribute their opinions and sentiments towards how it is used in society. Ultimately, I think that for technology that will ultimately impact patients, they should have a say in how this technology is used and how it's developed and we should be transparent with them on how this technology can be helpful to them, what it can or can't do. And that's what we intend to do at the Manhattan Project. We intend to be transparent with everybody involved, including the public, including regulators, bioethicists, and scientists, because with the technology as important as this one, we believe that every voice counts. Thank you for listening to my reactions to this podcast. For more information, please visit our website, www.manhattangenomics.com. 
feel free to send us an email as well, info at manhattangenomics.com. Você usa sua imaginação. Hey,